So what is the difference between a conservative force and a non-conservative force? And what are some examples of each of these? Well, let's go over the examples first. For instance, the electric force between charges is a conservative force. Friction is a non-conservative force. Any applied force, whether the force is to accelerate the object or decelerate it, that's a non-conservative force. Applied forces include any push or pull action. So let's say if you apply a force, if you push a box, that force is non-conservative. Or if you pull it with a rope through tension, that's a non-conservative force. Gravity is a conservative force. The elastic force in a spring is also conservative. So now, what is the difference between a conservative force and a non-conservative force? The work done by a conservative force does not depend on the path taken. It's independent of the path. So I'm just going to write path independent. The work done by a non-conservative force depends on the path taken. So I'm going to write path dependent. So let's think of an example we can use to illustrate this. Now, let's say if we want an object to go from position A to position B. And so this is going to be path 1. The first path is a direct path. Now the second path from A to B is going to be a curved path. So we're still going from the same position, from position A to position B, but it's just the road is different. Now the work done by a conservative force, like gravity, is going to be the same regardless of the path chosen. As long as the height difference between A and B is the same, let's say 100 meters, then the work done by gravity will be the same. So going from A to B, the work done by gravity will be 1,000 joules. Now I'm not focused on the sign, but let's say this work is to, it's used to increase the kinetic energy of the object, so technically it should be positive. Now the work done by gravity, let me put WG for gravity, for path 2 will be the same, 1,000 joules. So as you can see, the work done by gravity is independent of the path taken. Now the work done by friction is a different story. Now friction is going to decrease the kinetic energy of the object, so the work done by friction is going to be negative. So going from path A to B, it might be negative 300 joules. But going from path A to B using path 2 instead of path 1, it might be more like negative 500 joules. The question is, why is it different? Why is it more in path 2 than in path 1? Now, in path 1, it's a direct line from A to B. So therefore, we're dealing with a shorter distance. Now, path 2 is longer because it's a curved path. And so therefore, friction is going to do more work against the object because it's working against the object for a longer path, for a longer distance. And that's why it's greater for path 2. So just to summarize what we've considered, gravity is a conservative force because the work done by gravity does not depend on a path. As you can see, the work done by gravity for these two paths are the same. It's path independent. Now, friction is a non-conservative force because the work done by friction depends on the path. As you can see, the work is different for the different paths. It's greater for path 2 because path 2 is longer than path 1. And so now you know the difference between a conservative force and a non-conservative force. Now let's go over some formulas that relate to work with all of the conservative and non-conservative forces. The net work done on the object is basically the sum of the work done by all forces. 
And as we mentioned, there's two types of forces that we're considering in this video. The work done by the conservative forces and the work done by all of the non-conservative forces. Now, you need to know that the network done on an object is equal to the change in the kinetic energy of that object. And the work done by all of the conservative forces is equal to the negative change of the potential energy of that object. So if that's the case, what is the work done by all of the non-conservative forces? Let's subtract both sides by WC. So W and C, the work done by all of the non-conservative forces, is the difference between the network done on the object and the work done by all of the conservative forces acting on the object. Now we know that the network done on the object is equal to the positive change in the kinetic energy of the object. And the work done by all of the conservative forces is equal to the negative change in potential energy of the object. So therefore, the work done by all of the non-conservative forces is equal to the change in the kinetic energy plus the change in the potential energy. Now, it's important to know that mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and the potential energy of the object. So therefore, the sum of the change in kinetic energy plus the change in potential energy is equal to the change in mechanical energy. Now, you want to know these three formulas. They're important. The change in kinetic energy is equal to the network done on an object. And the work done by all of the conservative forces is equal to the negative change of the potential energy of the object. In fact, potential energy can only be defined for conservative forces and not for non-conservative forces. The work done by all of the non-conservative forces, let me use a different color to highlight it, that's going to be equal to the change in the mechanical energy of the object. So make sure you know these three equations. They're very useful. Now let's talk about this equation. The fact that the work done by all of the non-conservative forces is equal to the change in mechanical energy. So if we have a problem where there's no non-conservative forces, if there's only conservative forces, then the work done by all of the non-conservative forces must be zero because there are none present in which case the change in mechanical energy will be zero. And thus this leads to the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy. So if you have a system in which there's only conservative forces acting, there's no non-conservative forces, then the total mechanical energy of that system, it doesn't increase or decrease, it remains constant, which means the change is going to be zero. Now, let's talk about an example that's going to illustrate this concept. So let's say if we have a ball at position A, and it's 100 meters above the ground. Now, the ball is going to fall, and we're going to focus on position B. It's still above the ground, but in position B, it's 30 meters above the ground. Calculate the final speed when it reaches position B. Let's say if the ball is released from rest, so the initial speed is zero. What's the final speed at position B? Well, using kinematics, we can use this formula. V final squared is equal to V initial squared plus 2AD. The initial speed is 0. The acceleration is 9.8. And it's fallen 70 meters. Now, the acceleration is negative 9.8 because gravity points in a negative y direction. And the displacement in the y direction is negative 70 because the object falls down by 70 meters. So this is going to be 2 times negative 9.8 times negative 70. So V final squared is 1372. Next, let's take the square root of both sides. So the final speed at position B is 37.04 meters per second. So now that we have the speed of the ball at position B, let's calculate the kinetic energy at A and B. 
and let's say the mass of the ball is 10 kilograms. So kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. So at position A, because the speed is 0, the kinetic energy is 0 joules. Now position B, the kinetic energy is going to be 1 half times the mass of 10 times the final speed of 37.04 squared. 37.04 squared is 13.72 and then multiply that by 10 times 0.5 and the kinetic energy at position B is 6,860 joules. Now let's calculate the potential energy. The gravitational potential energy is mgh. So the mass is 10, g is 9.8, and at position A, the height is 100. So 10 times 9.8 times 100. The potential energy at A is 9,800 joules. Now what about at B? It's going to be 10 times 9.8 times 30. So the potential energy is 2,940 joules. Now what about the mechanical energy at these two points? The mechanical energy is the sum of the kinetic and potential energy. So if we add those two values, it's going to be 9,800. Now what about adding these two values? 6860 plus 2940 is equal to 9,800. So notice that the mechanical energy is conserved in this problem. Why is that? The only force acting on the ball is the force of gravity. There's no friction, no air resistance in this problem, only a conservative force. And whenever you have a system where only conservative forces are present in the system, the mechanical energy will be conserved the change in mechanical energy is zero because the work done by all of the non-conservative forces is zero because they don't exist in this problem. So thus we have the principle of the conservation of mechanical energy.